refuge and strength, the very present help in time of trouble. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the worship of God for College Hill Presbyterian Church. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. And on this last Sunday in July, it is such a gift to share worship with the people in the room, with the people online, with the people who will join this service by watching it later. For all saints, we are so very grateful. If you are new or newer to College Hill Presbyterian Church, we want you to know about what's going on. We have a weekly e-news that lays out all the programs, events, activities in the life of the church, all the ways you are invited to come along with us as we grow together in love. If you're not receiving that, send me an email, pastor at collegehillpc.org, and I will make sure that you start to receive it. We want you to come along. The beautiful flowers that you cannot see on camera right now, but they are behind me and they are gorgeous as I flip through my bulletin, are given by the Kangas family in memory of our amazing Nana, who taught us how to love, forgive, sew, and bake for very good things to do. We are so grateful for the gorgeous flowers I was just talking about you. Thank you for that. I want you to note some things. First of all, we are coming off a really exciting week of vacation Bible school. I cannot tell you how wonderful it was uh, to celebrate all week long with 43 kids. Staff or volunteers who worked on BBS were right here. Raise your hands, don't be shy. Come on, I see some Emily, yeah, 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 yeah. These people and others. loved on these kids all week long and used Vacation Bible School. We had a mission project this year, which was to purchase a dozen pair of sneakers for foster kids through an organization called Fostering Hope. Yes, I got that right. Good. Uh, and thanks to the generosity of so many of our families, we were able to do that. What an incredible week. Now, in the realm of faith formation program for the next uh, three Sundays, for August 4, 11, and 18, we will not have jam or roots on Sunday morning. The nursery will be wide open, and kids are always welcome here in the sanctuary during the service, but be aware of that for August 4, 11, and 18, as the faith formation team takes this time to plan for fall, which will be upon us before we know it. Finally, a word about the service this morning, two related things. Uh, I need you to know that today's sermon will deal in a very frank and straightforward way with the topic of assault. I want you to make wise decisions and do whatever feels safe for you and the people with you. That means you need to go stretch your legs during the sermon. I will not be at all offended. And also be aware that in keeping with that, the middle hymn, which is printed on, uh, which is, yes, it's in your bulletin, uh, labeled God Weeds, is an original composition by our own Tom Dressel that is in keeping with the sermon theme. So we're gonna do some important work together today. We are in the presence of God. And I invite you to give yourself permission to be here as we move more deeply into worship.
If you're worshiping online, you'll find the entire bulletin right there on our website here in the room. I would direct you to the front of it where you'll find our responsive call to worship. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we speak these words. The Lord upholds all who are falling. God raises up all who are bowed down. God is just in every way and kind in all God does. God is near to all who call on God. God is near to all who call in truth. Come, let us worship God. standing at some safe distance from our suffering and pain, but alongside us as one of us to help, to heal, to lead us to life. Gracious God, may your spirit do a renewing work this morning. Let hard hearts be softened, stony soil broken up. May the fresh winds of your spirit blow through this place, making us new. Through Christ we pray, amen. We are a wandering pilgrim people, prone to stray from the path. But a just and loving God yearns to bring us back. That's what this next part of the service is about. We speak truth to remember that we are loved. 
I invite you to join me in our prayer of confession. Holy One, hear us and help us to speak the truth about ourselves. We have wandered from your path. We have turned from people in pain. We have ignored your love for us. We are truly sorry and we want to return to your ways. Forgive us, free us, and make us new. Hear us now as we pray in the silence of our hearts. Now hear the good news. The scriptures say that if anyone is in Jesus Christ, it is a new creation. The old is finished and gone. Behold, everything is made new. Let us believe the good news of the gospel in Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. As a sign of our reconciliation with God, we exchange signs of reconciliation with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another with signs of God's peace. As you find your way to your seats, I invite the children to come join me on the chancel steps. is everybody doing today? Very convincing. I love it. How many of you came to Vacation Bible School at College Hill Presbyterian Church? Raise your hand. Some of us, not all of us, that's okay. For those of you who, who did, what should the people out there know about Vacation Bible School? What was one really cool thing that happened that you want the grown-ups to know about? Yeah. No, okay. You're just kind of waving your hand. Okay, anybody? What's, what's one really cool thing you did? Yeah. Ta making tie-dye like legs. Yes, making tie dye was super cool. I thought so too. What else? Having ICs. Yes, that was fantastic. Yeah. I'm just waving. Okay. Any any others got something you want to put out there? No. All right. I am so excited about being with you in church today that I really could use a high five. Who wants to give me a high five? Huh? Anybody right here? Yeah? Any others? Yeah? High fives? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody else want to give me a high five, Eli? Anybody else? No? Okay. Okay. So, some of you wanted to give me a high five. Some of you did not. Those of you who gave me a high five, what if I had asked you for a high five and you didn't feel like giving me a high five? What would you have done? Would it be okay to say, no thank you? Yes, even though I'm the pastor? 
Yeah. So one of the things that it's helpful to think about is that you are in charge of your body. And if somebody wants to give you a high five or a hug, but you don't feel like it, what can you do? Yeah. Say no thank you. You can say no thank you. That's right. Because you are the boss of your body. Now, obviously, it's a little different with mom and dad because sometimes they need you to do stuff you don't want to do, like take a bath. Anybody ever have to take a bath when you don't want to take a bath? Nobody's going to own up to that, but we know. So moms and dads are a little different. But remember, when you're at church or school, you are the boss of your body. And one of the things that we do at church is learn to respect each other by not touching friends who aren't in the mood for a high five or a hug. And I love that we get to practice that here and then you get to be the boss of your own body. Isn't that great? So listen, here at College Hill Presbyterian Church today, we have got the nursery open for those two and under, jam for those ages three to six, and then roots for kids who are seven and up. That's what happens after our echo prayer. If you don't know, kids, where you are going, find the grown-up who brought you to church today, and they will get you where you need to be. For now, let's pray. Dear God, Dear God. Thank, you thank you that you love us, you love us. and other people love us, <laughs> and there is so much love in this place. Help us to grow, to love you more, to love our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much, and you can head out that way for what comes next. Our first reading is taken from Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know that the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in the Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11. We're jumping into a story that we've not really been following. David is king of Israel, and it took a long time and a lot of struggle for him to come into that position and consolidate his power. But all of that has happened. He is settling in. He is feeling good. And we pick up in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 15. 
In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to fetch her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord. He did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you've just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths. My Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife as you live and as your soul lives? I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, and then draw back from him, so that he may be struck down and die. Here ends this reading of Scripture. May God help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Let us pray. Let the good news come now, O God not only in word, but in power, with the Holy Spirit and full assurance. Through Christ we pray, amen. We never get Bathsheba's side of the story. Did you notice that? We never get Bathsheba's side of the story, and I think that's a problem. Whatever is happening in this story happens to her. Now, we have, of course, heard this story before, but that might make it harder for us to hear what's really going on. Exactly what have we been told? about David and Bathsheba. What exactly do we think we know? It seems that there are two versions of this story in circulation, two different tellings of the tale of David and Bathsheba. One version portrays them as star-crossed lovers. I tend to see it as one of those old biblical epics by Cecil B. DeMille, or maybe a novel by Nora Roberts. David is hunky, quiet, very good hair. <laughs> Bathsheba wears too much eyeshadow. She's trapped in a loveless marriage. He's the king who has everything except the one thing he most wants. Their love will overcome every obstacle in order to bring them together. That's one version. 
Another version of the David and Bathsheba story, probably the more common one, tells it as a tale about a powerful man committing adultery. David has grown lazy, David has grown corrupt, so David has an affair, like Eisenhower and Summersby, like Clinton and Lewinsky, like JFK and everybody. <laughs> Sometimes noble men do ignoble things. And, you know, at least in this version of the story, we know that David is going to repent. He will uh, come around after this moment of weakness, this fleeting lapse in judgment. It's, it's soap opera stuff. Summer blockbuster stuff, lust, romance, adultery. That's what we say this story is about. I wonder what Bathsheba would say. In the world of ancient Israel, war is a lot like wearing white shoes or drinking gin. It's a seasonal pursuit. Just about the time that pitchers and catchers report, the armies of Israel go off to war. But this year, David does not go out with them. This year, David stays home, content to let others do the fighting and the dying. While the armies are at war, David remains in Jerusalem and his schedule seems pretty light. Lunch, followed by a nap, followed by peeping Tom time on the roof. From the top of his palace, David sees Bathsheba bathing. The woman is very beautiful and the king is intrigued. Now, I know what some of you may be thinking. Why is Bathsheba bathing in broad daylight in view of the king's palace? Isn't that a little provocative? Is she perhaps trying to seduce the king? Is Bathsheba asking for it? In the second part of verse four, the narrator tells us something important. Bathsheba is purifying herself after her period. And the narrator tells us this for a couple of reasons. So that we understand that Bathsheba is at the peak of her fertility. So that we realize that her husband Uriah could not possibly be the father of the child she will conceive. But also, this is a mikvah, a ritual bath. You see, under the Levitical code, menstruation renders a woman ritually unclean. At the conclusion of her period, she takes the ritual bath in order to restore her religious purity. So, let me say this just as clearly as I can. Bathsheba does not do something wrong. Bathsheba does something right. She fulfills a religious obligation. But David, sees her. And under his gaze, her act of devotion looks like something else. The king's interest is piqued. He asks, he asks about her, learns her name, and sends some of his flunkies to fetch. Did you hear that word when I was reading the passage, fetch? Fetch. 
That's something you do with your slippers. Maybe a pizza on the way home from work. It's not something that one human being does to another. David sends some of his flunkies to fetch Bathsheba. Does that sound like romance? Is that what this story is about? Summoned by her king, Bathsheba would have no choice but to report to the palace. David sleeps with her, sends her home. We don't know what Bathsheba thinks or how Bathsheba feels about any of this. The text never tells us. We never hear her side of the story. There's more to the text, of course. In due time, Bathsheba discovers that she's pregnant and informs David. David panics and engages in a series of progressively desperate attempts to cover his crime. It begins almost on a light note, call it Plan A. David summons Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, and plies him with crass boy talk. Go down to your house and wash your feet. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. See, David hopes Uriah will go home, sleep with Bathsheba, and come to believe the child is his, but it doesn't work. Uriah is a good soldier all the way to the end. He is a deeply decent man in stark contrast to his increasingly depraved king. And by the end of our reading, David is plotting his murder. <clears throat> There's a lot more to the story, but this morning, I want to stop here. I don't really want to talk about Uriah. I want to stay with Bathsheba. What is this story really about? What happens to her? Is this an affair or an assault? Is this a story of romance or rape? What is Bathsheba's side of the story? Well, she isn't here and she can't tell us. But to me, it sure looks like David rapes Bathsheba. That's what I think this story is about. And my question is, why don't we remember it that way? Why did I learn something different in Sunday school? That's not rhetorical. I almost certainly remember learning this story in Sunday school. Why have I sat through so many sermons on this text about adultery? as if Bathsheba had any say in what happened to her. But that's the thing about sexual assault. It so often hides in plain sight. It conceals itself in euphemism and excuse and blame. How short was her skirt? How low was her blouse? How many men had she been with before? How many drinks did she consume on that particular evening? That's the way it goes. First the crime, then the cover-up. A conspiracy of shaming and silence. First she is raped, and then we pretend it never happened. We ignore her side of the story. Or at least, we try to ignore it. But by the grace of God, 
Bathsheba's story lingers. It's right here in our Bible for anybody willing to read it. We hear it in worship. We pass it along to our children. All of our attempts to silence her have not yet succeeded, not entirely. Bathsheba's story lingers. And we, all of us, have gathered to hear it today to bear witness to what happened to her. Silencing is a strategy of oppression. Silencing serves the status quo. If the voices of the suffering are silenced, we never have to acknowledge that anything is wrong. If the voices of the suffering are silenced, nothing ever has to change. But if justice will be done, silence must be broken. And that, I believe, is why we are here. God calls us into the church so that we will learn to listen to this story, yes, but not just to this story. We gather to listen to the story of every survivor, of everyone oppressed and abused and ashamed. We're here to create space where silence can be broken and healing can begin. That's what church is, refuge, a sanctuary for the suffering, a place where God makes room enough for everyone to be heard. That's why we're here. That's how we heal. A gracious God invites us to listen to the other side of the story. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>
Join me in the affirmation of faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I invite you to the offering by God invites us to share life in this community where we hold space for truth telling, where we seek healing for all. When we give, we say yes to what God has in store for us. So let us give generously and with joy. Please be seated.
In the healing presence of God, we are invited to share what's on our hearts, that we might pray with or each other. If you're online, you can place a prayer request in the chat, and I will see it and share it. If you're in the room, please slip off a hand. After each request, I will say, God, in your mercy, and you are invited to respond here, our prayer. Uh, our Zoom producer asks prayers for the family of a colleague whose husband is facing possible hospice care due to his current condition. He's the father of three young adolescents. God, we cry out to you on behalf of this family, we pray healing and help and grace abounding. God, in your mercy. We pray for Yvette Dehabe and her family as they prepare to take the body of her mother, Margaret, to their homeland of Cameroon for burial. We ask you to continue to keep the family in your prayers. God, we pray for Yvette and for all who love and grieve Margaret, that your comfort would enfold them. God, in your mercy. Amen. People of God, for what else do we pray today? I'll bring them back. Please pray for my daughter in Virginia. Her name is Katie. She just received a cancer diagnosis. God, we pray for Katie. We know that your heart breaks with all of the things that break our hearts, that you are not a stranger to our grief, our fear. But may Katie and all who love her find you to be a healer and a helper, a refuge and a rock. For Katie, we pray, God, in your mercy. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Prayer of Thanksgiving for a successful trip to the Dominican Republic. It was uh, not without <laughs> incident, but we all came back with all of our digits and uh, and we had a successful um, trip. And thank you all for your prayers and support to the journey. And stay tuned for opportunities to hear more about that in the upcoming weeks. But God, we do give you thanks for the delegation's safe return, for the work that they did, for the good that will ripple out beyond what any of us can see. We give you thanks, God, in your mercy. Yeah. Okay. Send greetings from a member of our church who has moved far away. Her name is Sue Adams, and she now lives in Colorado, 
with her son, who is a pastor. And they're recently moving, so there's a lot going on in her, but she hasn't forgotten us. And I told her, we're, we haven't forgotten her. Yes. As the old song says, oh God, blessed be the ties that bind us. Even when we are apart, your love keeps our lives woven together. Thank you for that reminder. May we lean into the good, gracious gift of your people. God, in your mercy. Uh, and also a prayer for the friends and family of my friend Joseph, who passed away yesterday. Um, I've known him for a long time, since high school, and um, I, I reached out to him last year. We'd been in touch a little bit, but um, he always loved 80s music, and um, I took him to see Culture Club Berlin and Howard Jones, and I am so grateful for that time. God, we ask your comfort for all grieving the loss of Joseph. May they know something of the love that has promised to wipe away every tear. Thank you for good memories of life shared. Make us present and conscious, able to do things today that will strengthen us when we remember them tomorrow. God, in your mercy. We'll continue together into the prayer that Jesus taught using the words debts and debtors. It's printed in your bulletin, and you are welcome to join in. God, you are a healer and a helper. For the sake of our sister Bathsheba, we pray for survivors. For the ones who are worshiping with us, for the ones we know about, for the many, many more that we do not. God, make us a place where painful stories can be shared, brokenness blessed, wholeness acquired. Make us compassionate and wise to be that kind of a place for those who need it. God, we pray for our nation, all the topsy-turviness of our politics. We pray for civil discourse, for honest speaking and open listening, and pursuit of the common good. Pray your wisdom and we pray your protection for all who have responsibility for our common life, for all who seek public office. Preserve them and make them to be servants of the common good. We pray for our world, O oh God. We think particularly of Israel and Lebanon this morning. We pray your comfort for victims of recent violence. We pray that peace and justice would prevail. We pray that hostages would be returned safely to those who love them and that you would come to the aid of the suffering people of Gaza. In a world that can overwhelm us with terrible things, 
We pray for your spirit to fall fresh. Make us to be a sign of the sharing justice and peace you intend for all the world. God who sees all of us, who knows all of us, who embraces us with love, hear us praying as Jesus taught, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.